This episode of Because Science is sponsored by Fallout 76, available right now. Which starter Pokemon is the most powerful according to science? There are many seemingly eternal nerd debates. Kirk versus Picard, Goku versus Superman, MCU versus... I forget the name of the other one. The original starter Pokemon versus each other. While these debates may rage on online forever, I think science can be super effective for the last one. Can we actually decide which Pokemon you would want to choose in real life? Can we calculate just how powerful each one of them is? Let's begin by establishing our criteria. We want some way to compare the strength or power of the most powerful versions of the starter Generation 1 Pokemon, Charizard, Venusaur, and Blastoise. Now, I suggest comparing the energies of these pocket monsters' signature attacks. Energy is not some mystical, magical field of feelings. It's a unit of measurement, a property that can be transferred to an object in order to do work on that object or to heat it up. You can measure energy using the unit, the joule, which is defined as the energy transferred to an object as you put a one newton force on that object across a distance of one meter. But one joule feels like the energy it takes you to lift a 100 gram object about a meter off of the ground. And four and a half thousand joules feels like moving big boy Snorlax here the same distance. Energy comes in many different forms. One of those forms is kinetic energy, the energy of motion like you'd find coming along with a stream of moving water. Another form is chemical, like the energy released during the combustion that is a flamethrower. And another form, yet again, is radiant energy, like the energy that is beaming down from the sun. These are all different sources, but they're all united by the same unit. So now let's calculate and compare the raw energies of the Generation 1 Pokemon starters. Let's ignore in-game effectiveness and resistances and focus on just which has the most energy that can go on to affect other objects. Venusaur will be first. Venusaur's iconic power move is Solar Beam, which absorbs radiant energy from the sun and redirects it at an enemy. Canonically, the second evolution of Bulbasaur is two meters or over six feet tall. Given that value and to make things easy on ourselves, we are going to assume that the flower on Venusaur's back, the thing that is doing the collecting of radiant energy, is also two meters in diameter. The amount of solar energy hitting the Earth every second is around a thousand watts per square meter, meaning that every second, a thousand joules hits every square meter of space. Considering that Venusaur's flower is around three square meters, this means that the flowery beast can, at maximum, absorb 4,275 joules of energy every second, which means, hey, hey, get back here! It's around here somewhere, I just need to move an adequate number of spaces in this tall gray. Here we go! If Venusaur is the best possible solar panel, meaning that it is 100% efficient in its conversion of radiant energy into solar beam, then all we need is the charge time to get the final energy value. Now, I know that it takes a full turn to charge up solar beam, but in real life and in a real battle, you don't have unlimited time. So let's give Venusaur maybe 60 seconds to charge uninterrupted. The maximum energy value then for Venusaur's solar beam comes to a quarter of a million joules. That sounds like a lot, but remember for context, this is actually less than a third of what a single stick of dynamite would detonate with, which no! <sighs> Venusaur was a good start. How do the other starters stack up? Blastoise is a bit harder to work with. Its signature power move is Hydro Pump, and so we will be estimating the total kinetic energy of all the water shot out of Blastoise's cannons. The tricky bit is getting the dimensions of those cannons. If Blastoise can shoot a certain amount of water out of his cannons during a Hydro Pump in a certain amount of time, then the diameter of those cannons is going to determine how quickly that water comes out and therefore the kinetic energy of the attack. As you can see from this mass flow rate equation here, if you have some amount of mass coming out per unit time and you decrease the flow area, the flow velocity has to increase. And I know this is kind of just math to you right now, but you know this 
intuitively if you've ever put your thumb over the top of a garden hose. That's why the water shoots out faster. Blastoise is canonically 1.6 meters tall, and we don't know anything much more complicated about the creature than that. Though from the drawings over the last 20 years, we can guess that the diameter of the cannons are maybe a tenth of its height? This estimation gives us a pretty sizable diameter for Blastoise's cannons, 0.16 meters or over six and a half inches across. Finally, if we assume that a hydro pump from a Blastoise can't pump out more water during an attack than the volume of a total Blastoise, then wait a second, I was just, uh, uh, whatever. Like I was saying, if we assume that the total volume of a Blastoise, wow, right now, right in the middle of what I'm saying, oh, go ahead, bear, go. If we again assume a reasonable attack time for Blastoise, maybe under five seconds and Blastoise's volume, we can plug in all of our assumptions into the kinetic energy equation and get our total energy value. With 493,000 joules of kinetic energy in the water for each cannon, it gives a total hydro pump energy for Blastoise of nearly a million joules, which is almost the same kinetic energy that a mid-sized car has going down the highway, which makes almost perfect sense and is very plausible. I mean, imagine getting hit with a wall of water that felt like a car- ah! Both Venusaur and Blastoise both pack serious punches, but because of one line of pokey text, they do not hold a candle to the final starter. In Pokemon Red and Blue, the Pokedex entry for Charizard reads, spits fire hot enough to melt boulders. And if we're talking about melting anything, we're talking about thermodynamics. So for this calculation, we want to know just how much heat energy we need to add to something in order to melt it. I use a fun little device to help me remember just how much heat energy, Q, you need to add to something in order to change its temperature. Q equals MCAT. That's right. M equals the mass of the thing you want to change temperature. C is the specific heat of that material that makes up the object, which is just how easy it is to heat up that material per unit mass. And delta T here, the change in T, is the change in temperature you're looking for. We don't want to just change the temperature of something, we want to melt it. So we need a little extra kick of energy here, which will be the mass of the thing multiplied by what's called the enthalpy of fusion. And now, just like we did for the other starting Pokemon, we have to make some reasonable assumptions. If Charizard can really melt boulders, let's assume that it can melt a big granite boulder, the same diameter as its height, 1.7 meters or 5 foot 7. Because granite is a known substance, we can use this value with its density to get the mass, and we can also know the specific heat right off the bat, and the enthalpy of fusion, and the melting point of granite. So all we have to do is plug all of our assumptions and numbers into our MCAT equation and get the total energy value. So there's nothing else to do but finish this sentence uninterrupted. Come on, I'm not even in grass! Using our numbers and equations super effectively, if Charizard can melt just a single decently sized boulder, then its flamethrower or other fire-based attacks can harness nine billion joules of chemical energy. This is 10 to 20,000 times more energetic than either Venusaur's solar beam or Blastoise's hydro pump. Even if we reasonably scale down these numbers, Charizard will still be far and away the most powerful Pokemon that you'd want to choose. Oh, oh, hit, almost. Oh, oh, oh. Uh. Forget it. So, which starter Pokemon is actually most powerful? Well, if we ignore real in-game difficulty and resistances and effectiveness and how easy it is to get through the game with each starter and only focus on real-world energy comparisons, then Charizard would be far and away the champion. It simply takes more energy to melt stuff than it does to move a turtle's worth of water or charge a flower. Charizard may not have the most energetic Pokemon attack, period, but hopefully this analysis can help end the eternal starter Pokemon debate. Debate. It won't, because Psyduck, science. Sorry, I, I fainted a lot today.
There's also a line of text somewhere in Pokemon where it says that uh, Charizard has flames so powerful they can melt anything. So just think about how that would scale up. It's still the most powerful. Why is Charmander a flaming salamander thing? Well, there's actually a interesting thing there. For thousands of years, people have linked salamanders to flames. Like they can extinguish flames and they're born of flames. It goes all the way back to Aristotle thought that uh, salamanders could extinguish fire and they're born from fire. But this is obviously just a myth. They're, you know, they're just salamanders. But think back, think back when people were burning rotten logs for their fires and salamanders would pop out because that's where they lived. And they thought, oh, oh must have been generated from fire. They sounded like back then. So there's an interesting historical connection there between people thinking that salamanders are of fire and Charmander, like charred salamander. It's all, I'm sure Game Freak thought of that. Thank you again to Fallout 76 for sponsoring this episode of Because Science. Bethesda Game Studios, the award-winning creators of Skyrim and Fallout 4, welcome you to Fallout 76, the online prequel where every surviving human is a real person. Work together, or not, to survive. Under the threat of nuclear annihilation, you will experience the largest, most dynamic world ever created in the legendary Fallout universe. Fallout 76 is available now. Buy Xbox One X, get Fallout 76. Thank you so much for watching, Katie. Let me know what your favorite starter is in the comments, even if you are technically now wrong. If you want more of me, you can go to alpha at projectalpha.com. If you do that, sign up for a free trial. You can get this show two days earlier than everyone else. And please follow Because Science on social media, at Because Science and at SciFile. That's me. And you can give me ideas for future episodes, like, subscribe, all that millennial stuff that you're sick of hearing. Thanks.